Hey guys, David here and welcome to another video. Today we're finally having a look at this nice ortholinear split keyboard that I built from scratch. And uh, you've already seen me mention it in a bunch of previous videos. I uh, billet machined the frames for it completely from scratch on my Rattrick Killer Bee. So that was quite the process. And of course, I also, as always, uh, designed my own PCB. Um, there's a bunch of lessons to be learned here. And since I have a quite a special layout, I also went ahead and custom marked my own keycaps. So if you want to know how I did any of these, then stay tuned. Before we get into the weeds, I want to give a big thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this project and providing the PCBs that I used here. As always, they made a super high quality product uh, that just looks beautiful and functions great and it is very affordable as well. You can get up to 10 pieces, 10 by 10 centimeters, double-sided, silk green, everything for just $5, which is an amazing price for prototyping. So if you want to get started with your own project and start experimenting with your own PCB design, make sure to go check out PCB Way link down below. Now, I have built quite a few keyboards, uh, some of which you can even see behind me, and uh, most of them turn out really cool and they are quite nice. I used them for a little bit to try them out or, or I'm using them behind me on this PC or for example for the CNC I'm using one of my keyboards. But the main keyboard that I use every day at my main computer just has always stayed uh, some Razer uh, Chroma keyboard that, because it needed to be full size, actually full size plus some macro keys. I really liked uh, those switches and it just worked great. None of the keyboards that I built were like full size or like full size enough that, to the point where I would actually want to daily drive them. Now this requirement of wanting uh, something that really fulfills all of my criteria of being full size, of being easy to use, uh, having all the functions on it that I could ever need. And I also wanted to try some new stuff. I've built a 10 keyless keyboard, I've built like a 60% keyboard, I've built a bunch of micro pads, uh, but what I wanted to build was a split ortholinear keyboard. Now, there's quite a few of uh, them online, uh, yeah, various split keyboards, uh, various ergonomic keyboard designs, but uh, most of them have very limited number of keys, actually. It's just the standard letter block and sometimes even shrunk down in some uh, places so you can easily access all of the keys. But then you're stuck with like not having all that many keys. But I figured there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to have a split keyboard with all of the keys you regularly use for typing close by without having to move your hands, but then have extra keys on the side for like a numpad or all of the other media functions that you might want. So I settled on a 9x6 grid times 2 that gives me over 100 keys, which is pretty much on par with a regular full-size keyboard. But because everything is custom laid out, I just made sure that I have all of the keys that I need and not ones that like scroll lock or uh, insert and all of those keys that you don't really ever need and I just reprogrammed as macro that I of course don't have on this keyboard. I will show you a little bit later what layout exactly I settled on but that's something that is of course very personal and if you build a project like that the great thing is that you can customize the layout and I also moved some stuff around over the time of actually using this. To design the PCB I just uh, jumped into Eagle and uh, laid out everything I have finally figured out uh, all of the footprints uh, for the switches and uh, this time it is actually compatible with uh, Cherry Max uh, switches, uh, all of the Cherry Max compatible ones. It's also uh, compatible with the Alps uh, switches, the Chalk uh, switches and a bunch of others. So almost all uh, regular mechanical key switches are compatible and I have also uh, added some spots for some SK6812 uh, LEDs, uh, those are addressable LEDs that mount through the PCB, meaning that I, think I can easily solder them from the back and they're very easy to handle and look great. I obviously also uh, wanted to integrate uh, the microcontroller uh, directly onto the board and since uh, I don't really have any uh, spacebar or anywhere else on the keyboard that there is uh, extra space, the keys are all packed very tight, that was actually not enough for uh, the regular AU uh, footprint of the STM32U4 that I like to use. And I had to uh, go for the slightly smaller and more difficult uh, to solder MU uh, footprint. 
generally there's nothing different about that footprint. The only thing is that on the AU footprint, well, it, it's still a surface mount component. It nicely has the legs like out to the sides, so you can easily see all of them. You can check all of your solder points and more easily uh, solder it by hand. Whereas on the MU, they are underneath the chip, so you really can see everything quite so nice, but it still worked out, no issue. I also, of course, have a USB a Type-C port on there because what else would you use? And I have uh, now uh, slightly changed the footprint. I'm using a different one than I uh, usually used before. And uh, the main difference between this one and the one I used before is uh, this is much easier to solder and you can actually see all of the solder points. I had some issues uh, with the old footprint that I used which has some uh, solder pads underneath that are very small where uh, sometimes bridged some of them and there was not really any way to fix it. So I don't really know what this one is called. Uh, there is like over 50 different USB Type-C footprints. So uh, um, put the link down below uh, or maybe in the model number if I can find it. Now, sadly, uh, I was not able to uh, perfectly uh, get this uh, layout right the first time around. Uh, the way that I placed the crystal, it is right next to one of the SK6812 LEDs. And I was very surprised by this, but somehow uh, the crystal oscillator messed with the digital uh, signal for uh, this LED because until that LED everything works fine and then uh, that LED just starts blinking and everything after that doesn't get the proper signal anymore. However, if I bridge uh, the data uh, in and out of that LED, uh, all the LEDs afterwards light up perfectly. So something is really funky there. I tried replacing the LED multiple times, but the exact same behavior every time. So if you have any ideas, leave them down below. Uh, my best guess is that uh, the crystal uh, creates some kind of field or something that messes with the digital logic of the LED. I'm quite surprised by this, but the way I fixed it uh, is at the moment is to just not have an LED there and bridge it. Uh, because I don't have see-through keycaps uh, and it just kind of provides backlight, you can actually see it since it's one of the middle keys. Uh, you really can't uh, see unless you're looking for it that there is one that is not illuminated. But if I were to use uh, see-through keycaps, that would be much more of a shame. But I mean, there's nothing stopping me from just doing a revision of this PCB where I move over the oscillator slide. Apart from that, everything uh, worked out quite well and uh, there were no missing traces or any other issues that I ran into. Now, getting hold of uh, microchips at the moment is quite difficult and uh, they were sold out in all the regular places and uh, I found some on AliExpress, but um, well, it looked to be good to be true and it ended up being too good to be true. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're fakes, at least they did not work. However, what did work uh, was uh, buying a bunch of uh, Arduino Pro Micros, uh, which for some reason are still available and not much more expensive than the chip that is on them. So I just desoldered the chips from the Pro Micros and a reflash chip with my firmware, which worked uh, surprisingly super easy. And uh, that was a very easy way to uh, get the couple of chips that I needed. Then moving on, uh, the biggest part and the reason why this uh, project took this long once again was that I billet machined everything. You can see that uh, not all of the approaches uh, worked first try. Uh, the original metal piece is about 500 grams and the finished keyboard uh, top plate is about 70 grams. Uh, so that is a lot of metal removal. Uh, almost 90% of uh, the original metal uh, needs to be transformed into chips. And since I'm only just learning how to use my uh, Rattrick Killer B, this was quite the challenge. But uh, it has basically been a dream of mine to uh, build a billet machined uh, keyboard. That was one of the motivations behind building my very first CNC which then ended up being very ill-suited for this kind of work since I need a bunch of uh, very small tools and it has a slow spindle and a bunch of horsepower, which is the opposite of what I need here. But with the killer beat and the 23,000 RPMs on the spindle, I was able to uh, use even the one millimeter tool that I needed to properly cut out the keys very easily. And although it took a lot of time and a couple attempts, I managed to do it. Overall machining time for one of these top plates uh, is around two, two and a half hours, uh, but that does not include all of the programming setting up uh, and all, all of the other time. The way that I held it onto it is that first, I uh, used some double-sided tape to hold it in place and uh, some screws around the perimeter to clamp it down uh, to my MDF base plate, machined all of uh, the internal uh, features, uh, including 
the little holes where later I will screw them in and uh, then I tapped uh, these holes and machined a little uh, negative image of this inside pattern into the MDF board and screwed the plate down from underneath which then allowed me to access the entire top part and machine that, clean it up all around and it looks beautiful. If you want to see more about the machining, then you can check out my recent review of the Rat Trick Killer Bee. There I uh, showed a lot more of this footage and went into a bit more detail as well. Now you can see that the bottom is still 3D printed pieces. That's because I ran out of uh, 4mm end mills and generally larger single fluid end mills uh, since I broke them all uh, on the bottom piece. And since stuff uh, arriving from China takes uh, quite a while at the moment, uh, I figured I'd just put some 3D printed bases on there and make the video so that you guys don't have to wait too much longer and I'll just uh, replace those with the metal milled versions and I'll post a uh, picture on Instagram for sure and probably show it in a future video as well so you can see what it looks like once I have the, the enclosure fully milled out of aluminum. But the main important part was the top plate anyhow since that's the thing that gives structural rigidity and uh, really a solid hefty feel to it and also the one that is a lot more difficult to machine. Uh, so, so these keyboards, they are absolutely solid. There's just like absolutely zero flex in them, which is to be expected. And they're already quite heavy. And that is, although most of the metal has actually been removed. They definitely feel very premium and I'm so happy with how they turned out. I can't wait until they're fully aluminum. Uh, just a great project and something uh, that, although it was not perfect, there are some marks on there uh, that uh, I screwed up a little bit, but it's a great project because it worked out like 95% amazing and uh, it's on my desk every day, I see it, uh, it can inspire me, I, it's a project that worked out nice, a bunch of CNC machining and but still it also reminds me to always uh, be uh, mindful and watch out for the little details because there's always a little detail when you're machining or 3D printing or doing any of the other things. Then finally, the last piece of the puzzle was the keycaps. Uh, I knew that I needed, uh, needed uh, just like keycaps that are the same all across. So I uh, settled uh, on the DSA uh, keycaps. Uh, I already had some in this light uh, gray color and they were really high quality. So I knew uh, uh, this was the ones uh, that I wanted to use. So I got a bunch in black. And at first I just covered everything with black and engraved the symbols for what the keys actually do into them using the laser cutter. I just kind of cut out a little grid like this to position all of them and then engraved onto them. I do not know if the plastic is toxic. It might be. It's a polypropylene, I believe. Uh, so I made sure to not breathe in any of the fumes. And if you're going to do this, uh, make sure to do your homework beforehand and not like me, just go ahead for, for it. It was quite easy to engrave and uh, there's text on there. However, it is still black. Like you can read it but it is not super obvious. So, uh, while it was easy enough uh, to use the keyboard, uh, just hitting all the keys and especially like uh, some modifier keys just were not quite as easy to re recognize as I hoped. So I added uh, some uh, gray keys in there as well to just give you more of a visual anchor point uh, to quickly find all of the different uh, keys. And I feel like it looks quite nice as well. So I went ahead and also engraved those to match all of the other engravings. and. Uh, might go ahead and switch out some of them. I'm not 100% sure. Right now I have quite a lot of them. I tried with some of them uh, being there or not being there. Might uh, switch out some of them, but I quite like how it looks and it is very easy to use this way as well. Now, if you're typing on a regular keyboard, uh, getting used to ortholinear, there is a little bit, especially like the C and V, the way I was hitting them uh, on a regular keyboard. Uh, it took me a little while to get used to it, but now I'm just as fast on this keyboard as I was on my previous one. And there's actually a few comfort features, like for example, having uh, the backspace key uh, next to the spacebar uh, for my thumb as well. So you can see that there's only a very small spacebar and I actually only ever hit the spacebar with my right thumb in the exact same spot while typing, uh, I found out. So I only really use one key for the spacebar. And so next to them, on one side I have a backspace next to the spacebar, while on the, uh, the other side I have enter, uh, which just means that you don't have to reach all the way across the, the keyboard, especially for backspace. Uh, it actually uh, turned out that having backspace uh, on the left thumb uh, was so much faster uh, during typing and I got used to it surprisingly quickly and uh, means I have to like stretch halfway across the keyboard a lot less often uh, if I mistype something, which, well, to be honest, uh, happens a lot. 
Apart from that, I do have a couple special keys, like up here, I have like, like a key from my email address, uh, a key from my phone number. Uh, those are just things that I enter a lot uh, into various forms. So even on my previous uh, Razer keyboard, I had uh, some macros programmed for that. And um, it's just super convenient. Uh, so I, since I have enough keys, I uh, did that on here as well. There is, uh, of course, also like like a function layer uh, to, uh, for one, uh, on the top, you can change all of the different RGB settings, uh, cycle through the different uh, modes, uh, adjust the colors, the brightness, turn it on and off, that kind of thing. And I also added uh, some media controls, nothing too fancy on the second layer, just like the basic stuff that I would actually use. Now, I haven't even mentioned yet, uh, the software I'm using is QK. I've made previous videos about it as well. It's just very easy to customize. I was easily able to take the software for the previous one, just change the configuration around a bit and have all of the layouts. It just works great. It enumerates as a standard keyboard with the name uh, in the computer and just nothing to complain about there. So with that, I believe we have covered all the different aspects of it. It was quite the project and it's not even fully, fully done, uh, but I am very happy with this and uh, has fulfilled my goal of becoming my new daily driver keyboard that is on my desk all the time and I use every day. So with that, if you have any more questions, leave them down in the comments and I'll gladly get back to you. And if you want to know more, more, more in detail about a keyboard building, for one, I have a whole playlist of all the different keyboard projects that I did. Uh, going from the very beginning, I had no idea what I was doing, just experimenting uh, all the way to the more uh, recent ones that are actually working great. And I'm actually also working on a, a beginner tutorial series where I go through step by step on how to design the circuit and how, what to keep in mind, how to uh, do all of the electronics, the software configuration, the hardware design, all of that. So make sure you subscribe if you want to see that. There will be uh, probably like four part series uh, just about how to uh, build uh, these kind of DIY mechanical keyboards. With that said, thank you guys for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you guys next time.